In the months leading up to the presidential election, the corporate media worked in hyperdrive to sell Hillary Clinton to America. Party loyalists on both sides became frantic that the candidate they helped create could take the empire's throne with unpredictable consequences. Amidst a curtain of unquestioning and sycophantic media coverage, a bombshell was dropped by WikiLeaks just weeks before the election, exposing the inner workings of the Clinton clique. An ongoing series of thousands of emails from John Podesta, the chairman of Hillary's presidential campaign. While John Podesta is treated as just a well-meaning Clinton supporter who had his privacy unjustly exposed, he's actually one of the most powerful people in Washington, operating mostly behind the scenes, until now. John and his brother Tony are considered two of the most influential corporate lobbyists in the world. John has been dubbed one of Washington's biggest players by the New York Times, whose clients are going to get a blueprint for how to succeed in official Washington. And he's much more than just a millionaire lobbyist. He's also been the man behind Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and Hillary Clinton. The Washington Post praised his political experience saying no single person may be more responsible for shaping the ambitions of Obama's second term than he. But we should pay no attention to what the emails of one of the most powerful men in the world say. Instead, we should talk about Russia. Well, Chris, I, I think we should uh, take a step back and say how we got here, which is uh, that the Russians, uh, as the U.S. senior uh, members of the U.S. government confirmed, have been hacking into Democratic accounts, and now they've hacked into my account. You are uh, very clearly uh, quoting from WikiLeaks, and what's really important about WikiLeaks is that the Russian government has engaged in espionage against Americans. George. When you see something postmarked from Russia, you should be afraid to open up the documents. But these are legit, aren't when they? When you see, when, I don't know. I, I, I refuse to open these documents. It was the big money from a foreign person to the foundation at the time she was running for president. I, if this was, as you can see in those emails, this was a scheduling matter, and we didn't want her going overseas. I didn't want her going overseas uh, before the campaign was kicking off. Um, but again, th this is, these are stolen documents, stolen by the Russians, it's now confirmed from John Podesta. They are being put out for exactly this purpose. You know, I, I know that Russia and other forces would love us to have a debate. This is exactly what they want. They want us to have a debate about the internal structure of Hillary's campaign, what's true, what's not true, and I'm just not going to play that. As president, I will make it clear that the United States will treat cyber attacks just like any other attack. We will be ready with serious political, economic, and military responses. Just one problem, the evidence they're pointing to proving Putin was behind the emails is not evidence at all. Only two intelligence agencies, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and the Department of Homeland Security have issued a joint statement used by the Clinton campaign as so-called proof. Yet it's purely speculative, saying the alleged hacks are consistent with the methods and motivations of Russian-directed efforts. These thefts and disclosures are intended to interfere with the U.S. election process. Such activity is not new to Moscow. Consistent with the methods? So not really proof at all. The FBI also resisted getting behind the accusation on the basis that the claim was inconclusive. But the media simply repeats the claim as gospel, while never mentioning the other logical ways Podesta's emails could have gotten out. For example, his username was his own name and his password was literally password. In 2015, he left his cell phone in a cab. And in March 2016, Podesta gave his email login to hackers after falling for a phishing scam appearing to come from Google where he typed in his info. Not to mention the thousands of skilled hackers who are not part of a Russian government operation or a disgruntled insider who could have leaked the emails. When you look into the Podesta emails, the breadth of what they show explains why they're running such a desperate deflection campaign. Part of the WikiLeaks trove are transcripts to Hillary's infamous speeches she gave to banks and other corporations, for which she earned millions of dollars. In one, she assures her corporate sponsors that what she's saying to voters isn't her true position. Politics is like sausage being made. It is unsavory, and it's always been that way. But we usually end up where we need to be. But if everybody's watching, you know, all the backroom discussions and deals, then people get a little nervous, to say the least. So, you need both a public and a private position. And the way she discusses accountability for Wall Street, her number one donor, is very different behind closed doors. 
In one speech to Goldman Sachs, she criticized the fact that the banks were made into the bad guys for their financial collapse. And she thinks the very banks who rigged and crashed the economy are those who should be in charge of it. I think that there's a lot that could have been avoided in terms of both misunderstanding and really politicizing what happened with greater transparency. You guys help us figure it out. And let's make sure we do it right this time. The people that know the industry better than anybody are the people who work in the industry. Another major find they'd like to keep hidden is the unlawful coordination between Hillary's super PAC, Correct the Record, and her presidential campaign. A caveat of the devastating Citizens United ruling is that super PACs and nonprofits must remain independent of campaigns. Yet emails prove that Correct the Record is just another multi-million dollar arm of the Clinton campaign, making contributions between the super PAC and campaign indistinguishable. This short sampling of the Podesta email trove is alone a major expose of the true character of Hillary Clinton. But beyond that, understanding who John Podesta is and his political rise sheds light on who really pulls the levers of power in our society. John and his brother slash lobbying partner Tony have been rooted since childhood in the most elite circles of American politics. Their mother, Mary Podesta, was a well-known fundraiser at the center of the political scene. The Washington Post described her as a staple at political dinners, whose home-cooked dinner parties, quote, raised millions of dollars for candidates. The Podesta brothers would employ the same network-building style, with personas that reflect their high society characteristics. They're also both known for their fine dining culinary skills and deal-making dinner parties. Both are collectors of fine art, and are even known to have a competition between them of who has the better collection. You know, like most Americans do. Through the 70s, the young Podestas began building their political web. Jean first befriended Bill Clinton as an undergrad in college. Both brothers worked for Democratic Party campaigns in their younger years. With their growing political connections, also came business connections. Having accumulated a wide network of business and political insiders, the up-and-coming brothers founded the corporate lobbying firm, Podesta Associates, known today as the Podesta Group, in 1987. The brothers' relationship functions as different arms of a corporate lobbying beast. John's career put him inside the government, while Tony focused on the business side. The same year the brothers debuted their new lobbying firm, John became chief counsel for the Senate Agriculture Committee. And who was Podesta Associates' first corporate client? Genetech, a biotech company, which had a lot to gain from deregulating the agricultural industry. The Podesta Group then became the lead advocate for massive deregulation of the FDA on behalf of Genetech and other corporations. After Podesta was promoted by Bill to his deputy chief of staff in 1997, he and his brother's firm achieved a major victory. The Clinton administration signed the Deregulation Act the Podestas had been lobbying for. Podesta's rise in power came as he proved his loyalty to the Clinton team, becoming the cleanup guy for the Clinton's many shady scandals. Other than Bill Clinton's sex scandals, of which there were many, John Podesta found himself building the experience a Clinton partner would need, covering up their financial tricks and insider dealings. There was Hillary's insider trading scandal, where it was discovered that she used her powerful connections to turn a cool hundred grand. She was aided by a Tyson executive in an apparent exchange for millions of state funds awarded to the corporation by Governor Bill Clinton, breaking many legal rules, but turning $1,000 into $100,000 overnight. When the scheme was uncovered, Podesta was called in to bury it. And then there was Whitewater, where both Bill and Hillary were subpoenaed Again, with Bill's Arkansas governor connections, the Clinton couple was embroiled in a real estate scheme that involved hundreds of thousands of dollars in fraudulent loans. Of course, they counted on Podesta to run the cleanup operation. And his work did not go unrewarded. He was promoted to Bill's top assistant as chief of staff. It's no wonder that the Clinton scandal manager is currently at the top of the list to be Hillary Clinton's chief of staff too, after dutifully serving their first presidency. Throughout John Podesta's political rise, the Podesta group swelled in funds. After all, these skilled lobbyists had a seat in the White House and lifetime insider connections as a result. Today, the Podesta group boasts of stellar corporate clients like Walmart, British Petroleum or BP, and war profiteer Lockheed Martin. It also includes financial giants Bank of America and Sally May, war profiteers General Dynamics and Raytheon, media groups National Association of Broadcasters, National Public Radio, or NPR, biotech giants Amgen, Genetech, and Synthetic Genomics, 
energy giants Duke Energy and Sunoco, healthcare and big pharma Covidian, Merck, Novartis, and other corporate giants like Nestle. But the Podesta duo's true power in Washington would begin to be fully realized in 2003, when John Podesta founded the think tank Center for American Progress. The Center for American Progress bills itself as simply a policy advocate, but in reality, it's just another corporate lobbying firm. With its well-known inside access, the CAP entices its top corporate donors with roundtable discussions with Hill and national leaders. His board of directors includes director of Golden West Financial, the second largest savings and loan association in the U.S., and billionaire banker Tom Steyer, among others. Podesta's CAP trustees includes a Goldman Sachs vice president and notorious war criminal Madeleine Albright. The CAP's donors paint a fuller picture of the group's character. Its public donors include billionaire and regime change funder George Soros, and billionaires who made more billions driving the subprime mortgage crisis, Herb and Marion Sandler. They're joined by big banks of Citigroup and Wells Fargo, war profiteer Northrop Grumman, and America's health insurance plans. But as a so-called nonprofit, Podesta's center doesn't have to disclose its donors. The nation obtained their secret sponsors list, which include an even bigger network of shady corporations. It includes Comcast, Walmart, and General Motors, energy giant Pacific Gas and Electric, war profiteers General Electric, Boeing, and Lockheed Martin, and the right-wing government of Turkey. This buying access club has paid off lucratively for both sides, especially when a Democrat returned to the White House. John Podesta was tapped to lead Obama's transition team with his golden Rolodex to fill the new administration. Podesta stacked the White House with allies he knew would please the banks and corporations in their corner. For example, WikiLeaks revealed that a month before Obama won the 2008 election, an executive at Citigroup, a public donor to CAP, emailed Podesta. The subject line was lists, and in it was his recommendation for 31 cabinet-level positions. The exec, Michael Froman, wrote, the lists will continue to grow, but these are the names to date that seem to be coming up as recommended by various sources for senior level jobs. This random guy from Citigroup, offering who his banking partners thought should run the entire country, ended up being almost 100% accurate. The vast majority of the preliminary list ended up coming true. Froman even was the point person for applicants forwarding Podesta resumes from other insiders, begging to be on the team. Today, Froman serves as a U.S. trade representative in the Obama administration. But this was just the beginning of the Podesta's new influence, with unprecedented access to the White House. Records show that in 2009, the Podesta family had meetings in the White House 25 times. In contrast, only one such visit was made by Democrat Nancy Pelosi, who was Speaker of the House. John Podesta alone visited the White House at least 130 times between 2009 and 2013. The corporate representative was widely considered an informal advisor to the administration. The Podesta tag team boomed. By 2006, the assets from Podesta's center dropped from $23 million to $20 million. But with the Podesta stacked Obama admin, their assets doubled to $40 million. Its staff grew from only 20 prior to Obama to 270 by 2013. Likewise, the Podesta Group swelled during the Obama presidency. Between 2006 and 2010, Podesta Group staff tripled and profits doubled. John Podesta's rising influence built a wide and constantly turning revolving door between his center, its corporate sponsors, and the government. Among countless examples are Scott Lilly, a former congressman who took simultaneous positions as a national security lobbyist for the CAP and a lobbyist for Lockheed Martin. Lockheed was also a big CAP donor at the time. Spencer Boyer was the CAP's so-called expert on Turkey, secretly given millions by the hated and brutal regime. Boyer left that position to be Obama's deputy assistant of European affairs, which, quote, develops and implements U.S. policy in Turkey. Rudy de Leon, Bill Clinton's former Deputy Secretary of Defense became Director of Lobbying for Boeing, a major CAP donor, then Senior VP for National Security at the CAP. Today, Rudy simultaneously serves as a CAP lobbyist while on the Department of Defense Advisory Board and as a board member of defense contractor General Dynamics. Podesta's cash for favors mastery is most exemplified by his scheme during Obama's stimulus plan. 
The Center for American Progress had long lobbied on behalf of its renewable energy clients, who had a lot to gain from supposedly green reforms. In particular, big manufacturer of solar panels, weatherized homes, and so on. Podesta and the Center for American Progress were, of course, there to lobby for who should get the funds from Obama's stimulus. The CAP strongly advocated to direct stimulus money for a solar panel manufacturer called First Solar, a company that the CAP claimed no ties to. First Solar received close to $4 billion of the funds. But it was discovered afterwards that First Solar was actually part of the Center for American Progress's so-called business alliance of secret donors, a fact the center intentionally concealed. Steve Spinner, the Department of Energy's stimulus advisor who oversaw the transfer of funds to First Solar and other CAP clients, left his government job when the deal was done to take a seat as senior fellow of the CAP. Corporate lobbyist Jose Villarreal, whose clients include Walmart, Boeing, and Dow Chemical, simultaneously served on the board of directors for First Solar and the Center for American Progress during the stimulus payout. In 2015, he was appointed by Hillary Clinton as her campaign treasurer. John Podesta himself sits on the board of directors of an energy company and an investment firm who raked in massive amounts of green energy stimulus funds. Over a dozen other corporations donating to the CAP received these green stimulus funds from Obama's White House. While the clean energy John delivered billions to his supposedly environmentally friendly donors, Tony was busy raking in cash from big polluters like ExxonMobil to lobby to export fracking and BP during their catastrophic oil spill. The Podesta Group successfully stalled congressional inquiries into BP's disaster. The Podestas and the Clintons profited off many other backroom deals during this time. While today being the lead fearmongers about Russia, they had no problem getting paid by Russian oligarchs. Apart from the Podesta Group working for Russia's biggest state-owned bank, John helped secure the Russian purchase of a massive mining company called Uranium One, which had required the approval of Hillary's State Department. Uranium One, with mining rights to 20% of uranium in the U.S., was owned by a good friend of the Clintons, Frank Giostra. Russian elites funneled millions to the Clintons, as well as $180,000 to the Podesta Group to grease the wheels. The sale was predictably approved. While campaigning in April 2015, Hillary started receiving backlash for this apparent pay-to-play from her State Department. That month, as recently revealed by WikiLeaks, State Department official Jose Fernandez had written to Podesta saying he wanted to do all he could to help her campaign. Five days later, Fernandez issued a statement saying he was responsible for the State Department approving the deal, and Hillary had nothing to do with it. Scandal averted. He's also on the board of Podesta's Center for American Progress. The value of the Podesta's access only grew when John Podesta became Obama's senior advisor in 2014. While having stepped down as the center's president, he retains control through its board of directors and his appointed successor, Neera Tandon. Podesta was already on his way into the next administration, recruited in 2015 to head Hillary Clinton's campaign. He is now expected to get a top cabinet position. Today, while Podesta runs Hillary's path to the White House, his Center for American Progress advocates for her game-changing policies. For example, her promise to bring the sure-to-be-disastrous bombing campaign against Syria. And while the center helps her sell the next so-called humanitarian intervention, it will also be working hard to protect our most important shared asset, brutal foreign dictatorships. The Podesta Group has been hired for lobbying by the murderous Maliki regime in Iraq and the loathed Mubarak regime in Egypt. Tony Podesta also lobbied for a Qatari fracking company. The Clintons have their share of ties too, receiving tens of millions of dollars in donations from the regimes of Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait. But most scandalous is that one of the biggest donors to this supposedly progressive team is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, currently massacring dissidents in its own country, as well as thousands of Yemeni civilians. The Saudi regime funds the Clintons with at least tens of millions of dollars. And in 2015, the Saudi government also started paying $140,000 per month to the Podesta Group. Tony Podesta, who personally oversees the Saudi lobbying project, works to improve the image of the brutal Saudi regime. 
even the appalling defense of the beheading of political dissident Sheikh Namir al namir According to the New York Times, the Podesta group supplied a statement that insisted al namir was a terrorist. John's arm plays a role too, of course. While not directly funded by the Saudis, the Center for American Progress runs pro-regime propaganda, touting so-called great reforms in Saudi Arabia. One would think that such a deeply corrupt buying of favors by corporations and foreign governments from the country's most powerful politicians would be a major news story. But the Podesta Clinton team has networks for that too. Trusted progressive website, thinkprogress.org, is actually owned by Podesta's Center for American Progress. While the site claims to have editorial independence, WikiLeaks exposed how Podesta exercises editorial control. When a headline critical of Hillary Clinton appeared on the site, John wrote to his CAP partner, Neera Tannen, to have it changed. She responded, I will. They are crazy leftists down there. Soon it was replaced with a new, neutral headline. But it's not just the organizations financially sponsored by Podesta's think tank that curate their messaging. It's every establishment reporter that wants to maintain their elite access with two of the most powerful families in Washington. Politico reporter Glenn Thrush consulted with Podesta himself before publishing a report on Hillary Clinton back in May 2015, writing, Because I become a hack, I will send you the whole section that pertains to you. Please don't share or tell anyone I did this. Tell me if I effed up anything. No problems here, Podesta responded. Maybe Thrush was worried that if he didn't eagerly please the campaign, he wouldn't be invited to the next secret Podesta Clinton fan bash. Podesta and his partners hosted several glitzy affairs designed to, quote, give reporters their first thoughts from Team HRC, as well as framing the HRC message and framing the race. The nearly 40 attendees to one of these cocktail parties included Politico's Glenn Thrush, Huffington Post, Vox, New York Times, Vice, Daily Beast, and heavy hitters on MSNBC and CNN. Despite all of these far-reaching tentacles of influence, the Podesta-Clinton team are such obviously corrupt crime families that Hillary's candidacy is possibly the most unpopular of all time. Their decades of shady dealings have tainted them so much that the election put her neck and neck with the other most unpopular candidate to ever run. In fact, her entire campaign had to be predicated on fear of this repugnant billionaire game show host. They tell us the Republican Party represents corporate power, pollution, and war, which is true but they also tell us the Democratic Party is the antidote. Podesta's emails and Podesta himself show that the so-called progressive wing of the establishment is really just a neoliberal insiders club of the rich and powerful who loyally serve their corporate masters. Podesta's emails are more than just a window into one man, but a window into how the empire's political machine is actually run. And these truths are what can bring that machine's gears to a halt. <laughs>